Chapter Eleven, Part One of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter Eleven, The Natural Resources of the Nation, Part One. When Governor of New York, as I have already described. I had been in consultation with Guilford Pinchot and F. H. Newell, and had shaped my recommendations about forestry largely in accordance with their suggestions. Like other men who had thought about the national future at all, I had been growing more and more concerned over the destruction of the forests. While I had lived in the West, I had come to realize the vital need of irrigation to the country. And I had been both amused and irritated by the attitude of Eastern men who obtained from Congress grants of national money to develop harbors, and yet fought the use of the nation's power to develop the irrigation work of the West. Major John Wesley Powell, the explorer of the Grand Canyon and director of the Geological Survey, was the first man who fought for irrigation, and he lived to see the Reclamation Act passed and construction actually begun. Mr. F. H. Newell. The present director of the Reclamation Service began his work as an assistant hydraulic engineer under Major Powell, and, unlike Powell, he appreciated the need of saving the forests and the soil as well as the need of irrigation. Between Powell and Newell came, as director of the Geological Survey, Charles D. Walcott, who, after the Reclamation Act was passed, by his force, pertinacity, and tact, succeeded in putting the act into effect in the best possible manner. Senator Francis G. Newlands of Nevada fought hard for the cause of reclamation in Congress. He attempted to get his state to act, and when that proved hopeless, to get the nation to act, and was ably assisted by Mr. G. H. Maxwell, a Californian who had taken a deep interest in irrigation matters. Dr. W. J. McGee was one of the leaders in all the later stages of the movement, But Guilford Pinchot is the man to whom the nation owes most for what has been accomplished as regards the preservation of the natural resources of our country. He led, and indeed during its most vital period embodied, the fight for the preservation through the use of our forests. He played one of the leading parts in the effort to make the national government the chief instrument in developing the irrigation of the arid West. He was the foremost leader in the great struggle to coordinate all our social. And governmental forces in the effort to secure the adoption of a rational and far-seeing policy for securing the conservation of all our national resources, he was already in the government service as head of the Forestry Bureau when I became president. He continued throughout my term not only as the head of the Forest Service but as the moving and directing spirit in most of the conservation work. And as counselor and assistant on most of the other work connected with the internal affairs of the country, taking into account the varied nature of the work he did, its vital importance to the nation, and the fact that, as regards much of it, he was practically breaking new ground, and taking into account also his tireless energy and activity, his fearlessness, his complete disinterestedness, his single-minded devotion to the interests of the plain people, and his extraordinary efficiency. I believe it is but just to say that among the many, many public officials who, under my administrations, rendered literally invaluable services to the people of the United States, he, on the whole, stood first. A few months after I left the presidency, he was removed from office by President Taft. The first work I took up when I became president was the work of reclamation. Immediately after I had come to Washington, after the assassination of President McKinley, while staying at the house of my sister, Miss Coles, before going into the White House, Newell and Pinchot called upon me and laid before me their plans for national irrigation of the arid lands of the West and for the consolidation of the forest work of the government in the Bureau of Forestry. At that time, a narrowly legalistic point of view towards natural resources. Obtained in the departments and controlled the governmental administrative machinery, through the General Land Office and other government bureaus, the public resources were being handled and disposed of in accordance with the small considerations of petty legal formalities, 
instead of for the large purposes of constructive development, and the habit of deciding, whenever possible, in favor of private interests against the public welfare was firmly fixed. It was as little customary to favor the bona fide settler and home-builder, as against the strict construction of the law, as it was to use the law in thwarting the operations of the land-grabbers. A technical compliance with the letter of the law was all that was required. The idea that our national resources were inexhaustible still obtained, and there was as yet no real knowledge of their extent and condition. The relation of the conservation of natural resources to the problems of national welfare and national efficiency had not yet dawned on the public mind. The reclamation of arid public lands in the West was still a matter for private enterprise alone, and our magnificent river system, with its superb possibility for public usefulness, was dealt with by the national government not as a unit, but as a disconnected series of pork-barrel problems whose only real interest was in their effect on the re-election or defeat of a congressman here and there, a theory which, I regret to say, still obtains. The place of the farmer in the national economy was still regarded solely as that of a grower of food to be eaten by others, while the human needs and interests of himself and his wife and children still remained wholly outside the recognition of the government. All the forests which belonged to the United States were held and administered in one department, and all the foresters in government employ were in another department. Forests and foresters had nothing whatever to do with each other. The national forests in the West, then called forest reserves, were wholly inadequate in area to meet the purpose for which they were created while the need for forest protection in the East had not yet begun to enter the public mind. Such was the condition of things when Newell and Pinchot called on me. I was a warm believer in reclamation and in forestry, and, after listening to my two guests, I asked them to prepare material on the subject for me to use in my first message to Congress, of December 3, 1901. This message laid the foundation for the development of irrigation and forestry during the next seven and one-half years. It set forth the new attitude towards the natural resources in the words, The forest and water problems are perhaps the most vital internal problems of the United States. On the day when the message was read, a committee of Western senators and congressmen was organized to prepare a reclamation bill in accordance with the recommendations. By far the most effective of the senators in drafting and pushing the bill, which became known by his name, was Newlands. The draft of the bill was worked over by me and others at several conferences, and revised in important particulars. My active interference was necessary to prevent it from being made unworkable by an undue insistence upon state rights, in accordance with the efforts of Mr. Mondell and other congressmen who consistently fought for local and private interests as against the interests of the people as a whole. On June 17, 1902, the Reclamation Act was passed. It set aside the proceeds of the disposal of public lands for the purpose of reclaiming the waste areas of the arid west by irrigating lands otherwise worthless, and thus creating new homes upon the land. The money so appropriated was to be repaid to the government by the settlers and to be used again as a revolving fund continuously available for the work. The impatience of the Western people to see immediate results from the Reclamation Act was so great that red tape was discarded, and the work was pushed forward at a rate previously unknown in governmental affairs. Later, as in almost all such cases, there followed the criticisms of alleged illegality and haste which are so easy to make after results had been accomplished and the need for the measures without which nothing could have been done has gone by. These criticisms were in character precisely the same as that made about the acquisition of Panama, the settlement of the anthracite coal strike, the suits against the big trusts, the stopping of the panic of 1907 by the action of the executive concerning the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, and, in short, about most of the best work done during my administration. With the reclamation work, as with much other work under me, the men in charge were given to understand that they must get into the water if they would learn to swim, and, furthermore, they learned to know that if they acted honestly and boldly and fearlessly accepted responsibility, I would stand by them to the limit. In this, as in every other case, in the end, the boldness of the action fully justified itself. 
Every item of the whole great plan of reclamation now in effect was undertaken between 1902 and 1906. By the spring of 1909, the work was an assured success, and the government had become fully committed to its continuance. The work of reclamation was at first under the United States Geological Survey, of which Charles D. Walcott was at that time director. In the spring of 1908, the United States Reclamation Service was established to carry it on, under the direction of Frederick Hayes Newell, to whom the inception of the plan was due. Newell's single-minded devotion to this great task, the constructive imagination which enabled him to conceive it, and the executive power and high character through which he and his assistant, Arthur P. Davis, built up a model service, all of these have made him a model servant. The final proof of his merit is supplied by the character and records of the men who later assailed him. Although the gross expenditure of the Reclamation Act is not yet as large as that for the Panama Canal, the engineering obstacles to be overcome have been almost as great, and the political impediments many times greater. The reclamation work had to be carried on at widely separated points, remote from railroads under the most difficult pioneer conditions. The twenty-eight projects begun in the years 1902 to 1906 contemplated the irrigation of more than three million acres and the watering of more than thirty thousand farms. Many of the dams required for this huge task are higher than any previously built anywhere in the world. They feed mainline canals over seven thousand miles in total length, and involve minor constructions such as culverts and bridges, tens of thousands in number. What the Reclamation Act has done for the country is by no means limited to its material accomplishments. This act, and the results flowing from it, have helped powerfully to prove to the nation that it can handle its own resources and exercise direct and business-like control over them. The population which the Reclamation Act has brought into the arid West, while comparatively small when compared with that in the more closely inhabited East, has been a most effective contribution to the national life for it has gone far to transform the social aspect of the West, making for the stability of the institutions upon which the welfare of the whole country rests. It has substituted actual homemakers, who have settled on the lands with their families, for huge migratory bands of sheep herded by the hired shepherds of the absentee owners. The recent attacks on the Reclamation Service, and on Mr. Newell, arise in large part, if not altogether, from an organized effort to repudiate the obligations of the settlers to repay the government for what it has expended to reclaim the land. The repudiation of any debt can always find supporters, and in this case it has attracted the support not only of certain men among the settlers, who hope to be relieved of paying what they owe, but also of a variety of unscrupulous politicians, some highly placed. It is unlikely that their efforts to deprive the West of the revolving irrigation fund will succeed in doing anything but discrediting these politicians in the sight of all honest men. When, in the spring of 1911, I visited the Roosevelt Dam in Arizona and opened the reservoir, I made a short speech to the assembled people. Among other things, I said to the engineers present that, in the name of all good citizens, I thank them for their admirable work, as efficient as it was honest and conducted according to the highest standards of public service. As I looked at the fine, strong, eager faces of those of the force who were present, and thought of similar men in the service in higher positions who were absent, and who were no less responsible for the work done, I felt the foreboding that they would never receive any real recognition for their achievements, and, only half humorously, I warned them not to expect any credit or any satisfaction, except their own knowledge that they had done well a first-class job for that probably the only attention Congress would ever pay them would be to investigate them. Well, a year later, a Congressional Committee actually did investigate them. The investigation was instigated by some unscrupulous local politicians, and by some settlers who wished to be relieved from paying their just obligations, and the members of the Committee joined in the attack on as fine and honorable a set of public servants as the government has ever had an attack made on them solely because they were honorable and efficient and loyal to the interests both of the government and the settlers. When I became president, the Bureau of Forestry, since 1905 the United States Forest Service, was a small but growing organization under Guilford Pinchot, occupied mainly with laying the foundation of American forestry 
by scientific study of the forests, and with the promotion of forestry on private lands. It contained all the trained foresters in the government service, but had charge of no public timberlands whatsoever. The government forest reserves of that day were in the care of a division in the general land office, under the management of clerks wholly without knowledge of forestry, few, if any of whom, had ever seen a foot of the timberlands for which they were responsible. Thus, the reserves were neither well protected nor well used. There were no foresters among the men who had charge of the national forests, and no government forests in charge of the government foresters. In my first message to Congress, I strongly recommended the consolidation of the forest work in the hands of the trained men of the Bureau of Forestry. This recommendation was repeated in other messages, but Congress did not give effect to it until three years later. In the meantime, by thorough study of the western public timberlands, the groundwork was laid for responsibilities which were to fall upon the Bureau of Forestry, when the care of the national forests came to be transferred to it. It was evident that trained American foresters would be needed in considerable numbers, and a forest school was established at Yale to supply them. In 1901, at my suggestion as President, the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Hitchcock, made a formal request for technical advice from the Bureau of Forestry in handling the national forests, and an extensive examination of their conditions and needs was accordingly taken up. The same year, a study was begun of the proposed Appalachian National Forest, the plan of which, already formulated at the time, has since been carried out. A year later, experimental planning on the national forests was also begun, and studies preparatory to the application of practical forestry to the Indian reserves were undertaken. In 1903, so rapidly did the public work of the Bureau of Forestry increase, that the examination of lands for new forest reserves was added to the study of those already created. The forest lands of the various states were studied, and cooperation with several of them in the examination and handling of their forest lands was undertaken. While these practical tasks were pushed forward, a technical knowledge of American forests was rapidly accumulated. The special knowledge gained was made public in printed bulletins, and at the same time the Bureau undertook through the newspaper and periodical press, to make all the people of the United States acquainted with the needs and the purpose of practical forestry. It is doubtful whether there has ever been elsewhere, under the government, such effective publicity, publicity purely in the interest of the people, at so low a cost. Before the educational work of the Forest Service was stopped by the Taft administration, it was securing the publication of facts about forestry in fifty million copies of newspapers a month, at a total expense of six thousand dollars a year. Not one cent has ever been paid by the Forest Service to any publication of any kind for the printing of this material. It was given out freely, and published without cost because it was news. Without this publicity, the Forest Service could not have survived the attacks made upon it by the representative of the great special interests in Congress, nor could forestry in America have made the rapid progress it has. The result of all the work outlined above was to bring together in the Bureau of Forestry, by the end of 1904, the only body of forest experts under the government, and practically all of the first-hand information about public forest which was then in existence. In 1905, the obvious and foolishness of continuing to separate the foresters and the forests, reinforced by the actions of the First National Forest Congress, held in Washington, brought about the act of February 1, 1905, which transferred the forests from the care of the Interior Department to the Department of Agriculture, which resulted in the creation of the present United States Forest Service. The men upon whom the responsibility of handling some sixty million acres of national forest land was thrown were ready for the work, both in the office and in the field, because they had been preparing for it for more than five years. Without delay they proceeded, under the leadership of Pinchot, to apply to the new work the principles they had already formulated. One of these was to open all the resources of the national forests to regulated use. Another was that of putting every part of the land to that use in which it would best serve the public. Following this principle, the Act of June 11, 1906, was drawn, and its passage was secured from Congress. This law throws open to settlement all lands in the national forest that is found, on examination, to be chiefly valuable for agriculture. Hitherto, all such land had been closed to the settler. 
The principles thus formulated and applied may be summed up in the statement that the rights of the public to the natural resources outweigh private rights, and must be given its first consideration. Until that time, in dealing with the national forests, and the public lands generally, private rights had almost uniformly been allowed to overbalance public rights. The change we made was right, and was vitally necessary, but of course it created bitter opposition from private interests. One of the principles whose application was the source of much hostility was this. It is better for the government to help a poor man to make a living for his family than to help a rich man make more profit for his company. This principle was too sound to be fought openly. It is the kind of principle to which politicians delight to pay unctuous homage in words. But we translated the words into deeds, and when they found that this was the case, many rich men, especially sheep owners, were stirred to hostility and they used the congressmen they controlled to assault us, getting most aid from certain demagogues who were equally glad improperly to denounce rich men in public and improperly to serve them in private. The Forest Service established and enforced regulations which favored the settler as against the large stock owner, required that necessary reductions in stock grazed on any national forest should bear first on the big man before the few head of the small man, upon which the living of his family depended, were reduced and made grazing in the national forests a help, instead of a hindrance, to permanent settlement. As a result, the small settlers and their families became, on the whole, the best friends the Forest Service has, although in places their ignorance was played upon by the demagogues to influence them against the policy that was primarily for their own interest. End of chapter 11, part 1